Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Well, with the trillion dollars of spending that's coming out of Washington uh, in the last year or so, we are seeing a lot of money spent on things that we don't understand very much. And one of them is climate, the climate agenda, and all the money that seems to be steered to what my friend Myron Ebill calls uh, the climate change industrial complex. Uh, Myron is a director of the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute and probably knows as much about this as anybody on the planet. Um, I call him the maestro. It's sort <laughs> of a, it's sort of a common, you know, Malcolm Gladwell had Maven Connector and sometimes and 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 salesman. Well, Myron's not our typical salesman, but I think he's all three. Hence, hence the maestro. And anybody who has his signature uh, tag that says uh, "Stop Continental Drift" is uh, is a man we ought to be paying attention to. So, Myron, welcome. Thanks, Bill. I uh, please don't call me the maestro, but uh, it's good to be <laughs> good to be with you. Okay, I won't. I'll call you Myron. Well, let's start with the with what's at hand right now. We've got the the mansion bill that um, has come out, and it's got a lot in it that. Uh, uh, the, part of the continuing revolution, I guess, is that uh, it's supposed to address the uh, environmental permitting process, but it doesn't seem to do that. And it also has a lot of handouts to what we're calling the uh, um, the industrial, uh, what do we call it, the climate change industrial complex. Uh, so what what's this about? Well, you know, uh, Senator Manchin, uh, being the swing vote in the Senate, uh, was played games with this huge spending bill uh, uh, that finally he agreed to uh, in a somewhat smaller form in uh, July and August, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. And the biggest part of that was spending a whole lot of money on green energy and uh, climate change. So we have subsidies for uh, wind, wind power, solar power, carbon capture and storage, nuclear energy, a whole bunch of other technologies uh, and credits for buying electric vehicles. Um, and all of this money uh, is, uh, it, it was budgeted at three, $390 billion for the whole package. No, I, I don't have that right. Three hundred. I, I think that's right, but then three, there's also- 370 maybe. Yeah, anyway, well, who's, 369, who's, 370, uh, and uh, about $190 billion of that was uh, budgeted for wind and solar subsidies. But this is just an estimate. It really depends on how many uh, wind projects are built and how many solar projects are built and how much energy they produce. So the people who wanna make money, and I call it the climate industrial complex, but it's uh, in wind and solar, it tends to be groups of very wealthy investors who want to, to have a, a guaranteed return on investment and uh, the federal tax credit is necessary to guarantee all that, um, they have a problem, which is if, uh, for example, if you wanna build a huge wind facility in a very windy part of the country in Wyoming, well, nobody lives there. Uh, so they don't need much electricity. They have a very small population. Who needs it? California needs it. So uh, the, the Manchin-Schumer permitting bill was an attempt to figure out how to get uh, wind and solar from places where that don't have a very high demand to, to population centers that do have a high demand. Because uh, the problem that you face if you, if you want to make a lot of money off of uh, taxpayer subsidies is uh, it costs a lot of money to build transmission lines. And there wasn't any money in the bill for that in the Inflation Reduction Act. So well, the Manchin-Schumer permitting bill uh, would change the uh, permitting system for uh, high voltage transmission lines uh, in just uh, amazing ways. And uh, uh, they, <laughs> uh, luckily the bill failed one time in September uh, and uh, the Republicans defeated it. And we hope that uh, that will continue. Well, you pointed out that 
traditionally the permitting has been a state um, responsibility, the individual states. And part of what this does is it federalizes the permitting and it sucks all the uh, decisions back into the Federal Energy Regulation Commission. Do I have that right, FERC? Yes, that's right. FERC, and so Federal this is Energy this is the same kind of federalization that we're seeing them try through the Justice Department of uh, of our electoral system. So this is this is sucking everything back into um, you know the people here in Washington. Yes, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC has responsibilities for a number of things. It's kind of a grab bag. For instance, they permit new natural gas pipelines, but not new oil pipelines. They have responsibility for uh, uh, high voltage transmission lines, but ultimately they have to work with the states and the utilities involved. The Manchin-Schumer bill would say, if the Secretary of Energy and FERC, this independent commission, get together and decide that a transmission line is of national importance, then a couple, uh, three things happen. FERC can compel the construction of the line. That is, they can order it. They can tell the companies involved, the utilities, you must build this transmission line. The <clears> second <throat> thing is that they can start using eminent domain to condemn rights of way over uh, private property immediately. <clears throat> they don't have to negotiate. They don't have to work with the states. Uh, they could just start saying, this is where the line's gonna go and we're gonna condemn a right of way. And then the third thing, and this is uh, the, important, the really important part, uh, who's gonna pay for it? Well, traditionally, if you build a power plant or have a power source and you wanna hook it up to the grid, there's a law that says the utility is obliged to hook you up. It, I mean, not, not every time, but usually if you have a power plant or a power source, the, the utility is obliged to hook you up, but they're not obliged to pay for the power line to hook you up and the transformers and everything. This bill, the Manchin-Schumer bill would say, FERC can decide who has to pay for it according to who benefits. So uh, normally you would just say, well, the customers are gonna have higher rates because you have this very expensive uh, power line being added to your bill. But of course they can decide how wide that catchment area is. And so customers without knowing it will be compelled to pay for the transmission costs of people who are making out like bandits with tax, federal tax subsidies for wind and solar power. How much is this gonna be? Well, some estimates are in the trillions of dollars. I've seen one study that says to, that, that uh, getting to net zero emissions could cost $2 trillion in terms of transmission lines. So this is going to, uh, anybody who is uh, an electric customer is going to be paying much higher bills uh, to, to, to reward these people who have built wind and solar facilities. I, I want to go back to the sort of the, 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 the underlying assumptions here, net zero. <laughs> Uh, explain net zero and why we should care? Well, there's this idea that we have to get off of, of uh, any source of energy that produces uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So when you burn coal, oil, or natural gas, uh, you're going to produce uh, CO2 emissions. Well, when you burn anything. But... And, 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 and when and we exhale, that would be called carbon dioxide? Yes. We, we, so we're we also inhale, doing We, we yeah. inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. So uh, CO2 is the natural product of combustion. So we're, we're, we've been told that we have to get off coal, oil, and natural gas altogether, but people have pointed out, well, there's some way, it, it, that's not gonna be possible. It's, it's just physically impossible. So we'll, instead of zero emissions, we'll call it net zero emissions so that we still produce some CO2, but in some other way, we capture as much as we're using or we uh, counteract it or compensate for it. So it's not as, it's not as uh, uh, impossible a, a goal as zero emissions, it's net zero emissions. So there will still be some emissions. And on the other hand, uh, there will be something to balance it or, or uh, compensate for it. Well, the, the net zero, how does that link to the 1.5 uh, centigrade uh, uh, target that there, the World Economic Forum, the Paris Accord, um, and John Kerry have decided is the limit to how much temperatures can rise uh, in the world. And what is it until 2050? Is that the uh, 
magic date in which uh, this is supposed to happen? Well, there are a lot of numbers and I get them confused, but uh, when, initially the, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change back in 1992, of which the Paris Climate Treaty is, a, is an, an addendum, an, an appendix to it, the, the UN Framework Convention said that we, we should take actions uh, internationally to avoid dangerous interference with the climate system. But they never defined what that was. And so right. after, after being poked for many years and said, well, what is dangerous interference? This other scientific body that's attached to the, to the treaty called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, the IPCC came up with a number and they said, we think it's two degrees centigrade. So 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and that was the number for a while, uh, but then they started to say, oh, you know, uh, that's, that's not good enough. It's, it won't require enough drastic and incredibly expensive action because the climate really hasn't been warming very quickly. And so we got to lower the number uh, to avoid disaster. So the number they picked is 1.5. Uh, it's all it's all just games. There's is there's it, no. But, but, but isn't isn't a warming Earth a, a more hospitable hospitable Earth uh, for human beings? I mean, we you know we become more agriculture comes into play in places like Siberia. Uh, you know, there's a greening there's a greening already taking place in North America. If you look at aerial maps, uh, there are all sorts of good things that come from things being a little warmer. Far more people die. Uh, from the cold and from the heat. And so I'm, I'm perplexed why we're concerned about this, except maybe it's ice caps and rising um, ocean levels. I mean, what is the, I mean, I wanna go back to the, what we started with, but I still wanna to get to why we should care. Well, I, I, I agree with you. Um, look, there are, the, the whole climate change debate is really between data and models. <laughs> the data that sounds uh, exciting <laughs> well the data the, the temperature records that is yeah. how fast is the earth actually warming what is the his, climate history of the earth okay all right that's not very worrying because the warming that we've had since 1880 is uh mild and uh so far the impacts have been modest and and mostly uh, uh positive but if you have a computer model that says that the, the, the kind of warming that's like this is suddenly going to go like that, then uh, you, you see that, well, we better do something because instead of uh, eight inches of sea level rise per century, we're going to have eight feet or five feet or two. If you can scare people enough with a computer model, then this should drive the action. So you're absolutely right. The impacts are mixed uh, of warming. Uh, they're beneficial in some ways, not so beneficial in others. Uh, they're, they're modest. And uh, one thing that people, uh, uh, or that the global warming people forget to tell you is that if the, if the theory is correct, most of the warming will be in the upper latitudes in the winter. It won't be in the tropics or the subtropics. So Florida isn't going to get a lot hotter. Uh, but Manitoba or Saskatchewan or North Dakota may get warmer in the winter. In other words, instead of it being 20 below zero, it will only be 10 below well, zero. Well, in Myron, it's going to ruin the skiing in Davos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, you also, Bill, mentioned the, the greening effect. Uh, there's, sure. there's the indirect effect of carbon dioxide. It's a greenhouse gas like water vapor. Uh, there's not nearly as much of it as there is of water vapor. There's sure. we're up to 400 parts per million. That's one part in uh, 25, around 2,500 uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere. But it has a direct effect as well. And that is it greens the earth because plants use CO2. We, we give off CO2 when we exhale. Plants take CO2 in, in order to, to turn sunlight into, into carbohydrates, into energy that we can use. So yes, the earth is greening. NASA photographs from the, the satellite show this. It's uh, green, all the, all the northern or arbor arboreal areas are greening up. Uh, cropland areas are greening up, grasslands. 
So, uh, you know, a lot of the increased food production that we've had is, is undoubtedly due to higher CO2 levels. Well, the, 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 at this point, we seem to have lost the argument. I mean, the uh, Davos people, World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, uh, you know, uh, Larry Fink running BlackRock, all the other, Brian Moynihan at Bank of America, they bought the climate change uh, crisis hook, line, and sinker. But what I think we're talking about with the industrial, the climate industrial complex, they're all making a fair amount of money from, from uh, pushing everything in this direction. But it mm -hmm. seems to me, and, and this touches back on the, on the mansion bill and what we're seeing now, their arguments are going to run into some pretty tough stark realities. One of them is the physics, the materials, the, uh, the economics of creating uh, wind and uh, solar uh, power with its unreliability. I mean, first, we've got the issue of batteries. How do you store it? So when it's going to be uh, deliverable that you can actually use? And as you pointed out, the uh, where you produce it, I guess we'd, we'd have thousands of square miles of solar panels in Wyoming or wherever. And it, the reason we didn't put energy there is the transmission lines to take it into, say, Los Angeles, where where the power is needed. The the, uh, the costs of that are off the charts, and it's not even clear we have all the materials we need to build the solar and wind that they're talking about in these projections. And the materials that we we do have, we know exist on the Earth. A lot of them come from China, and or Africa in mines that the the Chinese control. So it seems like we're coming up hard against some of this. And then the other thing I want you, we want to talk about is your colleague at uh, CEI wrote a terrific uh, piece that uh, came out called Unleashing America's Energy Abundance, of which he, I think, sort of assumes that we're going to make go forward these climate change initiatives. But he says the regulatory barriers uh, to making any of this happen are are just unbelievable. And so setting a date of 2035, setting a date of 2050 is, 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 is fantasy because we'll never get there from here. Well, that's so there right. was a, that was a pretty complex question. If it was a question, probably more of a statement. But well, I think you made thoughts? a couple of, uh, you made a couple <laughs> of great points, Bill. I, first of all, the reality is uh, that if global warming does really turn out to be a problem, uh, it's a potential problem. Let's say it's a potential problem. Wind and solar are a dead end. They right. cannot provide the, the power unless we want to go back to you know living lives where most of the work is done by human beings and draft animals like horses and mules. Dark ages were a great time. Yeah, well, if you, if you were one of the very small percentage of people who didn't have to do all the heavy labor. Uh, but you know, uh, if you go back before modern agriculture, which is really machines plus energy plus fertilizer, and the fertilizer comes from natural gas and petroleum. If you go back before modern agriculture, over 80% of the people had to work on farms. Right. So uh, not and not live in cities and not have all the mod modern conveniences. So uh, if, if, wind and, if global warming is a problem, wind and solar are a dead end. Now, in terms of trying to create this, this new energy economy. You talked about all the obstacles to, is there enough material or are there enough minerals, critical minerals, uh, the, the various metals involved, lithium, uh, copper, uh, rare earths, cobalt. Well, yes, that we have a lot, there's lots. Uh, however, uh, nearly all of it right now is, pro is processed in China, regardless right. of where it's mined. And most, most of the what we call critical minerals are processed in China. Why is that? Well, the US is very heavily mineralized, especially in the, the, the federal lands west and Alaska. We have lots of, of minerals, but it's become very difficult to open a new mine in the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. And so you can do it, but whereas in Australia or Indonesia or China, it might take five to seven years, in this country, it takes 10 to 30 years. Now, if you're an investor putting up billions of dollars, where are you going to look? Are you going to wait 10, 10 years to get off the, uh, even get your permit submitted? 
then your environmental impact statement done for, to get a permit, then uh, years to consider the permit before you get a decision, and then it gets litigated because environmental pressure group, groups and preservationist groups and local people file suit, and then that goes on. So you're talking about, uh, I would say now for a big project, a minimum of 20 years. So if we're supposed to solve all these problems by 2035, they're not gonna be solved by mining in America. Well, in the regulatory thicket and the and the and the litigation risk is enormous. And, yes. and, and I guess the courts have given standing to almost anybody. I think Mario makes the analogy that if you're if you're on a or your fishing boat on a lake and there's a power line somewhere within your view. Um, that you have a standing in that uh, whether something new gets built uh, uh, in, in the case. And so you can have billions of dollars lined up to, to build the extension of the power line, but that person in that fishing boat uh, can get a lawyer and, and uh, block it. That's absolutely right. And <laughs> the, way our, the way the litigation has evolved, evolved since the National Environmental Permitting Act, NEPA, was passed in 1970, has meant that there are just multiple opportunities to litigate. Even if you lose round one, there's round two, then there's round three. So people can keep filing suit for uh, as far as the eye can see, even though they've lost every, every previous battle. So the, uh, this, this country, uh, used to, we used to be able to do things and produce things in this country. Uh, mm -hmm. It's getting increasingly difficult to do so. And that's why we're more uh, and more reliant on countries like China that haven't, uh, okay, there are some problems with the way China does things too. They're using forced labor to produce, uh, you know, uh, electric batteries or solar panels, and we want to stop that. But in terms of actually being able to produce stuff, uh, the United States is no longer a leader. We're, we're at the bottom. Well, it, Gosh, there's so many places to take this. Well, China, of course, building is building an electric power, coal-fired electric power plant basically every week, and they're about to overtake uh, the United States in terms of uh, coal-generated electrical uh, electrical capacity. So they're they're hardly uh, they're hardly among the uh, oh, oh, Bill, they're, they're way they're way, they 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 use much more coal than we do. I yeah. I've forgotten the numbers, but it's it's uh, it's roughly double. Uh, they use they burn twice as much coal as the United and States. And if you care about if you care about the pollution or, or the or the environment, I mean they're they have no controls over that really. Whereas we have very stringent mm -hmm. controls here. Well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go too far down that path. Um, China is we have a bunch of old coal fire power plants. We haven't built any new ones for a long time. Okay. Now, scrubbers were put on them, but China is building new uh, uh, up to date power plants that are much cleaner than the old ones that we have. Now we have scrubbers which make ours clean, but okay. no, they're, they're, but they're burning so much coal that that's why uh, you see these. Uh, and, and when you see all these uh, uh, film of, of uh, you know, smog and, and uh, uh, dirty skies in, in Beijing or Shanghai, yes, that's true. But as they build a newer generation of coal-fired power plants, that will, that will go away. Uh, I think what so the people... Chinese so the Chinese are behaving sensibly. Yes, they're they're very rational. They go to the UN climate conferences and they say, yes, we we're going to do something, but not yet, <laughs> because we our economy is not yet a developed economy. We're a developing and country. They're a developing. We're a developing country, and we need to get as rich as you are before <laughs> we can afford to do anything. So we will keep building coal fired power plants, and then, but we promise at some point we'll stop. But of course, that point is not next year, it's 10 or 15 years from now. So <laughs> China, China is very rational. And just talking about coal, the United States has the world's largest reserves of coal. And yet we're locking them up, closing down the mines, closing down the coal-fired power plants, and relying on more expensive forms of power. Well, it, it seems if we had a a light regulatory environment. I mean, the EPA did a lot of good in the early years, cleaning up the the air and the water, and that you know that was a reasonable thing to do at the time. But it's gone way, it's way overshot its mark, and now we've got all the other agencies involved, and there's incredible overlapping matrix of uh, federal government agencies involved in this. 
At what point does this, I mean, you've been following us for years, and we're seeing now with uh, the Ukraine, Russia, Nord Stream sabotage, shutting off gas to uh, uh, Germany, possibility the German industrial complex is going to have a very rough time because, for example, their their chemicals industry depends on a natural gas, fertilizer, right. food prices. The ordinary person in America and in Europe is going to be looking at a very tough winter. Energy prices, electric prices are what, up 10 times in, uh, in the UK and in, uh, in, in Germany? And are these are these talking points or the do you, I, I always go to Myron because you you kind of say okay well that's the hyperbole let me tell you what's really happening what well you, you know I Bill I, I think you got it right uh, look Europe is further down this agenda some years ahead of us now California is some years ahead of most of the rest of the United States so we ought to be able to look and see what are the consequences of these policies. And yet everybody in this country is trying to say that it's caused by something else or just deny that it exists. Europe's energy system became so fragile as a result of these green energy policies that now faced with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the uh, 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 cut off of, of the gas pipelines, they are faced with uh, just a, a crisis of enormous proportions, which is not just uh, high energy prices, it's people freezing to death and uh, entire industries closing down because they don't have enough energy to stay warm or to keep the plants operating. So, so let's look at uh, California, which is not as far along, but is farther along than most of the United States. Well, but when you say they ahead, have, they have, when you say when you say ahead and far along, can we just define that a little bit? As, it's down. Uh, it's down. It's down. <laughs> heading, it's towards, down. heading towards. Heading towards. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's Bob down, and then you go off a cliff. But no, look, <laughs> California has has uh, had a whole summer of of uh, black uh, blackout warnings. They got pretty lucky. They didn't have those blackouts, and yet California can draw on the entire western grid whenever they need power. That's hydropower in the northwest. It's solar panels in Arizona, windmills in Wyoming. So uh, they, they have these threats of blackouts and they now have gasoline that's over $6 a gallon. And uh, so if you wanna see what happens, uh, what will be the next step in California? Well, look at Europe. Uh, so we, we, have, uh, we have the examples and we should be looking at them and learning from them and saying, hey, this can't possibly be the way forward. We have to rethink these policies. If you believe global warming is a problem, let's look at some technologies that might actually work. Well, just to do politics a bit, the Republicans have not been very good on this. It seems to me that if you've got polls which suggest that only 1% of voters, or I think all voters, and even 2% of Democrats think climate change is the biggest issue we face, it seems like with gas prices where they are and this extraordinary handout to the uh, climate change industrial and in, 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 um, complex, there's a tremendous political issue here. And we yes. could take back and then, you know, I, one of the things I would set my sights on is cutting through this, uh, the, the climate grip on, on Washington and, and freeing America up to be energy in, uh, independent and, and, and in fact dominant. Yes, well, of course, that was the agenda pursued by uh, Donald Trump when he ran for president, and it's yes. the one that he implemented when he was elected. We, we were energy dominant, and in 2020 and 2019, the United States was the world's largest producer of oil and natural gas combined, and we were self-sufficient in energy. That is, we exported more total energy than we imported for the first time since 1957. So this was a tremendous success, and it's all been undone by the Biden administration and the Democrats in Congress in, in uh, less than really a year. They did it all in a year. So um, we are now faced with um, uh, new obstacles to, to energy production in this country and uh, new obstacles to using that energy, to burning it, coal, oil, and natural gas. And it's raising costs, electric rates are going up, gasoline prices have gone up. 
Uh, and, you know, this is, this is not a, a good look for, for a healthy America, for a prosperous America. And I think um, if, you, if you look at uh, why the how the Republicans have responded, uh, I think that President Trump had the right approach, which was aggressive and positive. We need affordable, abundant energy. What the Republicans in Congress have done is they, a lot of them, particularly the leadership in the House right. uh, and some, a, few sen a few Republican senators, they have a kind of, they talk light green, you know, it's, uh, they, <laughs> they concede the issue, they concede the problem. And then they, but they're unwilling, they're, 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 they're smart enough not to vote for these things. They, they all voted against the so-called Inflation Reduction Act with all of these subsidies, but they still want to talk a light green game because they've got some pollsters, and I won't name any names here, but I think you know who they are, sure. who are advising people like uh, Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. And they're telling him, well, there's a certain class of suburban voters that we need to win back, and they like the green talk. But when, when it comes down to it, they still don't vote for the green policies because they can see how disastrous they are. So they're, they're conflicted. And I think you're right. They would be better off making an aggressive, uh, confident uh, case for abundant, affordable energy. Because as you said, climate is down in the polls. Climate change ranks close to last in every, right. every ranking that the public gives in, to pollsters on what they're concerned about. So I, I think you're absolutely right, but I, I, you know, uh, they just don't listen to us enough. Well, they will. We're going we're <laughs> to change that. Well, we've, I promised you I wouldn't take too much of your day. This, is, this has been fantastic. How about a, how about a final word except? I'd like to make one of the final words. We need to make this a politically toxic issue for the Democrats. And I think we can make it a kitchen table, pocketbook, um, visceral uh, issue for people that even though it sounds nice to be green, um, it's wrecking America. Well, I, Bill, I think that's right. And I think you see uh, gas prices have, have sensitized people to these problems. And that's why you're now seeing stories in the newspapers. I saw one just last week saying, well, uh, climate change may be the most important issue, but Democrats aren't talking about it on the campaign trail. Well, <laughs> they, they, they're, they're actually really smart. They want, they want, to, they want to reward uh, their, their buddies and clients in, in the climate racket, but they know that they're going to lose elections if they talk too much about it. So I think you're right. The Republicans could really make hay if they would if they would make it an issue uh, and push back uh, uh, against. Uh, uh, well, let's the whole, you I, the whole. You and I know a lot of these people, so we got to we've got <laughs> it's up to us. We got to step up. <laughs> well, Myron, yes. Myron Ebel, uh, Ebel, I you know head of the. Uh, Center for Energy and Environment Competitive Enterprise Institute. It's fantastic talking with you. I won't, I won't give you the the title, but I still think that you're probably the best thinker we've got on these issues, and how to and and the political and the and the regulatory uh, issues. And I I certainly suggest everybody take a look at what's happening at CEI, and the writings that Myron does and his whole team to uh, get a good grasp on uh, how we can win against this, uh, I would say, evil. Uh, so anyway, thanks for uh, tuning in to the Bill Walton Show. Uh, as usual, you can find this show on all the major podcast platforms, YouTube, Rumble. Uh, it, this, we will be on CPAC now at next Monday night uh, at 7 o'clock. And, uh, you know, thanks for joining. And as always, send us your, uh, your ideas to the website, thebillwaltonshow.com, and we'll put them in the, in the mix and hope we can uh, uh, bring them out for you later on. So anyway, thanks. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read every one and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.